Welcome no to History Bites. How nice to have people come out in the rain. Good to see everyone. Um, today I just have a few announcements before we start our talk and want us to thank Cindy for setting up the room for us here at the Jones Library in the comforts of uh, our, our larger space over here, also for the better graphics. We appreciate that. And thanks to Amherst Media for taping this so that we can see it on air later on on the website. So today's speaker I'd like to introduce, and I'm happy to have her here. She is Marjorie Seneschal, and she is the Mathematics and History of Science and Technology professor at Smith College. So how does science and technology fit into silk? Well, in fact, she spent 10 years working on the famous Northampton Silk Project, and that was a fascinating series of events that happened over in our sister city across the Connecticut. And she has also had two books that she's written or co-wrote. One is Northampton's Century of Silk, and the other is American Silk, 1830 to 1930. So she's very well versed in this topic. She also has a couple of books and probably innumerable professional articles, but we have other books of hers in her field of mathematics. Today we're happy to have her come and talk about 100 Years of Silk. We give you Marjorie Seneschal. Mm -hmm. Triple the wires. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. I know it's a busy day and a rainy day, and uh, I'm really pleased you're here. And <clears throat> I don't want this to be a formal lecture. I'll talk and show pictures, but if, please interrupt the talk and say things, contradict me, ask questions, anything you want as we go along. Let's make it as informal as we can. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, 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 the history of the silk for this the century and interspersing it with some of the things that we did in the silk project. Because what, part of what we were trying to do there was to recover this century-long history. And part of recovering it is to live it. And living it for us meant making the machines that we could find patents for, uh, that had been used in the old, old early days, raising silk, or doing the whole bit as best we could. We didn't try to sell anything that we could create. <laughs> and you'll be able to see why that was a good idea not to do that. Uh, anyway, I, I framed this in terms of four questions, which I know you've seen already. Um, and uh, they may seem like they're totally unrelated. What did Emily Dickinson's dad do in his spare time? Um, why did Sojourner Truth come to the valley and why did she leave? Uh, how did Florence, Massachusetts get his name? And what held the wing parts of early airplanes together? And why we should care? And uh, to my, really, I pose these questions because they astounded me as I went along this project that silk is really the thread, literally, that links them together. And they all have a lot to do, in fact, with silk. So let's see what that sort of thing was. Uh, oh, by the way, one thing, uh, this is a wonderful quilt that Sally Dillon, who lives in Amherst here, made for us. She's a silk artist. Uh, this is the history silk, history quilt. And everything that I'm going to talk about shows up in here somewhere on this quilt. And um, we have it, I think it's still online as a, a click map. So you can go online and see this quilt and click on any one of these and then the story that the little panel is, uh, is about will come up and you can read about it. So anyway, uh, let's see. Um, one thing that's very curious, uh, how many of you have ever spent any time looking at the Northampton City Seal? I'm sure nobody. Uh, and I don't think anybody in Northampton has either, but if you do look at it, you notice a couple of things. There's two women talking there, and it says justice, education, and, and uh, charity. But look at what's around the, the sides. And if you look closely, you see those are silk moths and mulberry. Uh, mulberry leaves, these are the leaves here and the moths and then leaves and moths and they go around and then there's more of them over here. And then if you look a little more closely, you see among all the other things, the towers and the church and so on, the smokestack. And this was the silk mills. So these are really in, in the city seal, uh, unannounced, but they're there and they remind, remind us, if you look closely, what the city was all about and what made the city what it is. <clears throat> so I want to remind you about the life cycle of the silkworm. <laughs> You, uh, you need to know it to understand 
how and why the silk industry here was so problematical and what the problems were and why they were so, so difficult. So, so um, begins, let's say, we can begin anywhere we want to, but begin with the eggs. These are tiny little things about the size of sesame seeds. And then uh, when they hatch, they hatch into little tiny worms. They're black. That little tiny worm crawls around and will eat only mulberry leaves. Um, and uh, there are some, a few other things that we eat, but that mainly mulberry, leaves of mulberry trees, and they have to be chopped fine for it, and there's a whole lot of, of uh, folklore that goes with that, but anyway, there is one eating a mulberry leaf, and they eat and become huge compared to the original size. They just eat day and night, and they become this big, hideous looking things, <laughs> and when they get to be this big, uh, they then go on to some twig if they can find one, and a silk person who's raising the silkworms will provide them with things to climb on. They go up there, and what they do up here is they've been storing all this all the time in their stomach as a liquid, it's liquid silk is what they turn it into. And there's this, they have a liquid gland, a gland for the stuff in their stomach, and they begin spinning it out through spinnerets in their ear, on the side of their head. So these are not ears over here, these are spinnerets. And they wrap themselves up in a mile-long filament of silk, and that's their cocoon. So when we see cocoons, they're really just a wrapped up moth, a wrapped up, not yet moth, wrapped up uh, <coughs> silkworm. And while they're in the cocoon, they then rearrange themselves completely and turn into moths. And when they have become a moth, this is the psychology child learns in school, but it's interesting to see what happens. When they get to the stage that they're fully developed, they spit out an acid. And that acid get, create, cuts a hole in the cocoon, and they can crawl out of there. And they come out, and here you have this beautiful thing. Uh, after all these thousands of years of raising silkworms, this, they're so overbred, they cannot fly. They can't do anything. They can't even eat. And all they can do is mate, lay eggs, and die. So they, then the cycle begins again, and round and round and round goes. And if you're interested in getting that silk and doing something with that silk, you want to interrupt this cycle. And so what you do, first of all, is you don't let this life cycle go through completely as it is around the circle, circle, cycle. Uh, you cut it off at this point. You re remove, you don't let it get to the moth stage. When the silkworm has wrapped itself up into a cocoon, you want to get those cocoons. And you get those cocoons, and then begins the fun. So harvesting the cocoons, and then, then the next step you have to do is to stifle the developing worm because the worm is still in there turning into a moth. So they stifle it in the desert countries, they put it out in the sun and let the sun bake them. Or here in New England, they would steam them. There are many debates. I mean, every step of this process is so fraught. And one of the big debates is how do you steam them? In what? And the consensus on one side was that you should steam them in water, another that you should use rum. And so back and forth, they were fighting over what to steam them with, but they had to steam them. So that was, the, and then once you have the, once you know that the, uh, the silk worm is dead, then you can begin to try to extract the, uh, the silk from the cocoon. The cocoon is silk, but it's extract, you pull it off. So that's the next step. So um, all this goes back to ancient China. And this is, we, we, Stan and I visited there. This is a, I forgot what province it is. This is a cat mouse. This is a cat mouse temple, yeah. And the reason is that the silk, the dimension of silk and the discovery of what to do with silk is credited to a goddess from China who was sitting under a mulberry tree one day and a cocoon fell into her tea. And instead of screaming and running off, she looked at it and noticed it was beginning to unravel. So she began tugging on a little thread that she found in the cocoon and gradually realized she was pulling off silk or something. And so that's the legend. So she's the, the silk goddess and she is credited with domesticating <coughs> the cat. And why, why would she do that? Because she needs the cats to eat the rats. And the rats love the silk cocoons. So the rat, if you store them with silk cocoons in, in your shed, they're likely to get eaten by rats. And so she got the cat, they got the cat to do it, and this is the cat mouse temple. Which, and this became China's, this is how China made it into the world. I mean, the silk was its biggest, biggest, uh, most famous commodity. And it was kept as a dark secret that nobody was allowed to know outside of China. This was a secret, but the secret got out. And the way that it got out was a prince in a neighboring country uh, decided to marry a princess in China and persuaded her to put the silk cocoons and the whole bit in her headdress. And then she had, they had a glorious wedding and she had the whole thing on her head. 
and they got married, and then therefore she brought silkworms and everything out of China and all the knowledge, and that's how it spread. And it spread around the world, and many, many countries became very wealthy from that. And that brings us up to King James. Um, uh, who, well, let's go a little bit about that time, King James. When Thomas Harriet uh, with Sir Walter Raleigh went exploring Virginia, he discovered we found silkworms fair and great, as big as our ordinary walnuts. There's no doubt, but if art be added, they will rise in great profit and time to the Virginians as they're done now to the Persians, Turks, Italians, and Spaniards. So he was egging on King James to build up an English silk industry, which he had wanted to do for a long time, but couldn't do it because it's too damp there. And you can't raise silkworms there. They, 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 they get sick and die. So he had to find a colony where it was dry enough, warm enough, and quite the time that was right. And so here's Harriet telling him that he's found it in Virginia. So King James went after that, and he sent silkworms to his colony in Jamestown. And Captain John Smith replied, there was an essay made to make silk, and surely the worms prospered excellent well till the faster workmen fell sick, during which time they were eaten with rats. Uh, so there were no cats in Finley, in Jamestown. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, King James did not give up. And he had a book drawn up, written, about how to raise silkworms. And you can see from these pictures, it's ridiculous. It's not what silkworms look like, and so forth and so on. Uh, but anyway, he sent this instruction book to every household in the colony and threatened to punish people who didn't, didn't plant mulberry trees to feed the worms. And the trouble that he had there was that the colonists were getting, doing better raising tobacco. And, but King James was a ferocious anti-smoker. And he felt that this was the worst, you know, the, the worst punishment one could do to oneself. Uh, it was bad for your health, it was bad for everything, and he tried to get people to stop smoking. And he said, he pulled out the, the, the wisdom of the medicine of his day, and he says, you have to, you have to, you cannot smoke, it's bad for you because your lungs are cold and wet and your brain is, is hot and dry, and people say that smoking then will, will balance your humors, but actually it destroys your humors because it doesn't go to your brain. And the whole, all this kind of, of uh, 17th century uh, uh, medicine, he pulled out and argued against smoking, but nevertheless, as we know, smoking went out and tobacco went out. Nevertheless, all the colonists began developing uh, <coughs> silk and raising it at home, mainly to make their own thread. And so the, it really continued all the way up through the revolution. And um, even here it came to the valley. And by the 1830s, it was a, a cottage industry. People made their own silk thread, or they bartered it at the store. There was regular back and forth. People knew how to do this. And it, it, it wasn't great silk. It wasn't silk on the par with Turkey and with Spain and so on. But it was usable. And they, they, they did this. And uh, it turns out, I didn't notice until today, that Amherst uh, History Museum next door has some made here in the valley in the 1830s at, what was his name, uh, Timothy Smith Farm. And here it is, and you can come up and look at it later. It's really quite nice. It's the whole hand of it sitting there from behind it. Thank you for letting me know that. That's in the 1830s. And uh, the, uh, there were prizes for it at Three County Fair. And this went on and on like that until uh, a young entrepreneur came to town, town of New York, Samuel Whitmarsh, who had heard that, he, that uh, the valley was doing well with elementary silk growing and that it was, he thought it was time to start a real industry up here. Um, not just doing it in your own kitchen and mining your own silk, but to actually have a mill and do this thing on a bigger scale and get rich and sell it. Uh, and he bought an old oil mill, which convert, then converted into a silk mill. Um, and uh, in what's now Florence, but that time was called Grove's Meadow, and that was about 1834. And that's a picture then from a historical book about this. And uh, he then wrote a book. He traveled all over Europe looking at, seeing see how people did things. He wrote a book called Eight Years Observation, uh, Experience and Observation in the Culture of the Mulberry Tree, um, and in the Care of the Silkworm, with remarks adapted to the American system of producing raw silk for exportation. Now, what would be the American system? Well, he made that up. <laughs> it wasn't the American system. It's just uh, what he meant by that really was you can forget about all the fussy details that these Europeans have. Uh, Europeans had all kinds of rules for how you take care of the worms, how you do this and that, and that was learned by thousands of years of experience. 
And Whitmer said, don't need any of that. Just get the worms, feed them the, the mulberry trees. He also was in the mulberry business. And people think he was really, that was really what he was doing, was selling mulberries. And uh, there became a great mulberry craze here that was equal to the tulip craze in Holland. Uh, and Whitmarsh was getting everybody into this and had, building, as I said, he built his, his factory. Um, he fitted it out with, <coughs> with this, these were lofts for where to put the silkworms and so forth and so on. But the American system meant just do it, don't worry about it. Now, that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is from, the silkworms are extraordinarily finicky things, creatures, and they do get sick, and the number of diseases is just legion. And also, in these other countries, this is from China, uh, this was part of life for a long, long time, and they knew what they were doing. And children, you can see, literally learned uh, how to take care of worms in their mother's, on their mother's knees and their mother's laps. Here is someone who had, what she has here are these trays which are filled with mulberry leaves, mm -hmm. and little worms are on top of them eating. And she's putting them in the, up here to eat, and then she'll feed them some more. And meanwhile, mother's having tea, and the children wandering around. And they learn this stuff by osmosis. From birth. And in the United States, nobody knew any of this. And so they would get Whitmarsh's book and try to read it with one hand and do all this with the other hand. And it wasn't so good. Uh, but then after the worms got big enough, then they had to unwind. Uh, that's the next big step. And here you have, again, in China, this is a woman sitting at a heated basin, and the cocoons are in here. This is mimicking when the silk goddess had one cocoon in her hot tea and saw it unravel. Here you have a big basin that's heated and then you with water and in it, and then you have the cocoons unraveling, and you take them together and wind them up on a winder, and that's how you get the silk off the, the cocoons. And here again, you have people watching over the fence, they're all talking, this is part of their life, and here they didn't have a clue. And there were so many little details, like when you let the silkworm eggs hatch, and when you do this, and how finely you chop up the, the leaves, depends on how big the worm is, and all this, that's the kind of thing Whitmarsh said was nonsense. Uh, just pay no attention and get on with it. Uh, and many people got into this. This was a big, big, big deal around here. Uh, and there was an organization called the New England Silk Growers Convention, the Association and Convention. <coughs> in as much as in America and China, the mulberry tree is found in the native forests. It's a manifest indication of divine providence that this country, as well as China, was designed to be a great silk grower country. And who signed this but Edward J. Dickinson, mm -hmm. the father of Emily. So that's my first question of what did he do in his spare time. He was raising <laughs> silkworms in the barn. And I've been looking, I've come through her poetry to see if there's anything there <laughs> about a worm. <laughs> I haven't found it. But maybe you all know her poetry better than I do and you found something in there. But uh, I'm, I'm, well, the she must have grown up with this, so she must mm -hmm. know about it. But um, anyway, so that, they were all. They were all into this, everybody was doing it. And then uh, Whitmarsh built the second mill, uh, but then the whole thing collapsed. I think it was, the, it was too much uh, speculation, mulberry trees and so on, and the whole thing collapsed. And so there was the mill with all the equipment in it and nothing happening. And uh, just at that time, a group of abolitionists um, and utopian, uh, utopianists uh, decided to form a society in the Northampton area called the Northampton Association for Education and Industry. And they needed a place to live, and they needed a business. And so they thought, why not buy this mill? We can live in the mill. They actually lived on the upper floors. And let Silk be their business. They thought they'd take it up. They didn't really understand what they were getting into. Some of them had raised Silk as children at home in Connecticut and other places, but they didn't understand that manufacturing was on a whole different order. Uh, but nevertheless, that's what they did. So they took on, they paid off all the debts. Samuel Hill, who was a uh, Northampton resident, paid off the debts. He they, they formed the association, they moved in, and it was really, you know, it's, it's a legendary group. Uh, Sojourner Truth was a member of it, and uh, <coughs> so were several, many other prominent uh, uh, abolitionists, and it was, it was a wonderful thing, it only lasted five years, but nevertheless, while it did, it was famous. They believed in and practiced equality of all races, of women and, and men, and also children who were allowed to vote, uh, but they didn't, <coughs> as far as I can tell. Uh, but they could have. And so it was quite an egalitarian place, an interesting place, and they all tried to do everything from scratch and also to raise the silk, and that was their main uh, product. And what we know, I mean, there's a lot that's known from all kinds of records, and Christopher Clark has written several books on the uh, uh, 
the, this, is, this society, but one of the most interesting things we have is from uh, letters from a family, the Stetson family. Uh, Jay Stetson and Dolly Stetson, who you see here in their older years, uh, joined the society in 1843, and he became the chief salesman for the silk. <coughs> he would be out on the road trying to sell this stuff that they had made. Uh, and she was <coughs> at home with three or four kids, and at home being at the association, at the, and she would write him letters every day, put it in the packages of silk that they would send him to sell, and then he would write back. So these letters stayed went from attic to attic in the Stetson family until 1998, imagine. And then somebody found them and realized what they had and donated them to the Historic Road Hampton. And so Chris Clark and Carrie Buckley, who was director of Historic Road Hampton at the time, um, decided to edit them and publish them. And then several of us got involved. I, got, I wrote a chapter in there on the silk industry and how, they, how that worked. And then someone else wrote about the black um, residents of the community. And there were, I think there was one more. But anyway, um, they're fascinating letters. And, they, the children were particularly uh, involved in silk manufacturing because um, they had little hands and they could handle things well. And so some of, many of the interesting letters tell about that. And so what were they doing? Uh, it's hard to imagine that they could have done this at all, but they did it, sort of. Um, they raised mulberry trees, they raised the silkworms, they unwound the cocoons and, just, and made skeins of raw silk. And then they wound the skeins on bobbins, and they twisted this silk into thread, and they wound it onto skeins again, and then they dyed it. And each one of these was fraud. And then they all sent all this stuff off to, to the father, to James Stetson, uh, packaged and sample products and advertising and sales, and, and he went around trying to sell this stuff. And he had a lot of competitors, because they were not very many American competitors, but they were importing silk from Italy and other places, so he had to try to compete against, um, shall we say, more professional silk. So, uh, and Almira Stetson, one of my favorite letters, she writes to her father in 1845 that about the silk that they just produced, the blue-black dyed uh, silk. You can scarcely tell it from Italian, and then she puts, oh, what a lie. <laughs> uh, but they did try to push it off. And many, many American silk company, silk groups of uh, growers uh, gave, uh, used um, Italian sounding names for their product so that people would be fooled into thinking that it was Italian. Um, and here's from the Northampton Silk Project. This is raising the silkworms it's in middle school here. Um, and then recreating the machines. This is one for unwinding the cocoons. You can see down here um, the cocoons are floating in this bucket that's heated. You can't see the heating thing, but it's underneath. And then they're putting it through the little holes here and winding it up onto uh, make skeins here. And you can see that this is silk that's been wound from here. Uh, and this is a, a direct model, a copy of this. As we have found this in the patent um, that made this thing. Um, and this is a, a winder to make things onto bobbins that was done here in 1838. And the original patent model is this. It was in the Smithsonian. They lent it to us for the silk project, which was lovely. So it came home for a year. And then one of the students in the project actually dyed the silk with natural dyes. And we had so much fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, and this is uh, from the, the association's record books of the dyes, and, uh, from the dyeing department. And it's hard to read, uh, but there's ammonia in here, and um, mm -hmm. molasses, and soda, and vinegar, and castile soap. But these are all things that they put in there, along with whatever, mm -hmm. uh, whatever colors they were doing to make the dyes. And so. Uh, anyway. uh, and the Stetson family also, in addition to the letters, had a, a case um, that they had kept of cocoons. And these are some of the worms at different stages in the bottles here, and then some of the silk that I guess James Stetson was selling. And they kept this case that was there with the letters. So that's also in the store for Camden. And uh, the uh, local silk company later, which, which I'll tell you about as we haven't got going, I've also made cases like that. And here's a, this is a little one. Theirs is much bigger, but I brought it so you can come and look at that. <coughs> After the kinds of things. There's silk and the, the different stages of the moss. And um, then the, the association broke up after five years. And there were many reasons for it. Uh, two of the reasons. One is that they didn't do well with silk. Uh, they didn't sell. It didn't sell. I mean, it, it, nobody got fooled. 
that it was a tag, and they knew it wasn't. And uh, they had a lot of problems selling it, and they had trouble with the worms, and they had trouble with unwinding, and they had trouble with the mulberry trees, and you name it, every trouble they could have, they had. But they also had all kinds of internal squabbles. And one thing that surprised me reading the letters was learning that people who I had thought were so, some way were heroes, like Sojourner Truth and Samuel Hill, actually were people I wouldn't really like very much. Um, they were rigid hardliners. And so here you see Mr. Bassett has decided, this is Dolly Stetson to James Stetson, Mr. Bassett decided to leave and commence his packing up today. I consider this a death blow to our association. He goes down in consequence of some things that were said to him in a meeting holding at Samuel Hills last Sunday. This is her spelling. Sojourner commenced upon Mr. May for leaving the children to play cards. Uh, and what Mr. Bassett defended him, Mr. May loved children in the game that he taught them was a mathematical game. Um, Samuel Hill told him he better go. And then she adds, Sophia Ford did not think it worse to play cards than the evening. And so, so Bassett laughed. And people were leaving this kind of thing. Now, Sojourner was, and Samuel Hill were, were really um, buddies in this, and they were extraordinarily rigid, and I was surprised. I mean, there's one story in there that I forgot which one it was, I think it was Hill. Someone was playing the piano after 7 p.m. or something. There was a rule, no piano after 7 p.m. He slammed the lid down on a person's hands. Oh, you know, this is, I mean, like my own piano teacher used to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, so they, they were, they were, they had very fierce views and they were very rigid about them. And some of the views we can think were great and some of them we may regret it and didn't hold. Anyway, so it was internal squabbles, people leaving in a huff, getting angry at each other happens with many utopian societies, and this one broke up. Uh, and that's when the silk industry really began uh, like in Northampton. So up to now, is sort of up to now. And then it got going. And what happened was that Samuel Hill, the rigid, you know, contrarian, decided to stay. Everybody else left. They left at home, wherever that was, Connecticut, New York, whatever. He stayed here and decided to manufacture just thread. I uh, wasn't going to do to think about cloth, which they never had done anyway, but he was going to do thread. And he wasn't going to use the Mill River anymore for power. He was going to use steam. This was a new idea. Um, and no more silkworms. He decided that you can buy the silk from Japan. And then after, you, after what you buy from Japan, you still have to twist, you have to dye, you have to do finishing on it, you have to turn it into a real thread. Because the raw silk is just as it comes off the cocoon. That's not ready to use for anything. We even sew nothing. So it was the manufacture of the raw silk into usable thread uh, that he thought would be the thing to do. And that's what he set up his mill for. And not having to rely on the Mill River uh, was a big help. Because as you know from the Mill River, it is clogged up in the fall with leaves. It's frozen in the winter. It's uh, flooding in the spring. And it's, it's a mess. Um, but there were 70 mills at one time on the Mill River, by the way. All of them losing that dreadful little river. For, for their power. Anyway, he set the steam mill, and this is uh, what he began. And he called it the Nanatuck um, silk. Um, now, what he did that was special was he used a new device that he had a patent for, although he didn't, I don't know whether, we don't know whether he actually invented it, but the patent was assigned to him for making a triple twisted thread. So the thread that had been used, most people had made, had, you take two strands and twist them together, but they untwist. Uh, and what he found is that if you have three strands, they stay together better. And that makes a stronger thread stronger because of three, but it also holds together better. And even in the Bible, there's a phrase that says the three cord is not quickly broken. And I think he probably, being who he was, took it from the Bible uh, and the idea. And he made this thread with a very simple machine, which we made again and we were able to use, and it really does work. Um, and that was what he did. And he, with the timing was unbelievably good because this was just when the sewing machine was perfected. Perfected in the sense that, that Isaac Singer got a patent for a model that really worked and didn't have the kinds of problems that other sewing, earlier sewing machines had had. And his machine worked well, did everything except he had one problem. And his one problem was he couldn't get any thread uh, that would withstand the tensions that it, his machine put on it. So if you've used an old Singer machine, you know you have to thread it through this hole and this hole, and then it goes up in this loop, and then the thing goes up and down. And it's real tension, a lot of tension on the thread. And if your thread is weak, it will snap. And all the thread that he could get snapped. And Singer had made this triple thread, triple thing that he thought, ha, and he went up to see him. Um, 
and he showed him, uh, gave him the spool, and Sayer put uh, <coughs> put it on his machine, and it didn't snap, and that was it. He was thrilled, and he said, "I shall, uh, I'd like to. I, I'll show you the next slide. The, I'll, I'll buy all you can make for me." And so then he wrote checks for thousands of dollars to Hill, and Hill did it. And Hill came home from that and told everybody the good news and decided that the town, the borough of Meadows where they lived, uh, should be renamed Florence for the great silk emporium of Italy. Uh, and <laughs> so they all agreed this was going to be another you know, Florence, Italy, and they renamed the town Florence. And then there was a proposal to rename the river, the Mill River, the Arno. <laughs> And that one failed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, this is the triple, you can see here the triple uh, twisted and the sewing machine, and that became Florence. And uh, we actually were able to find the, the checks, cancel checks, uh, that Singer had written to Hill. And this is only one of many. They were all stapled together and I mean, <coughs> pinned together or something. Uh, and so that's what put, that's what got things going here. It was, it was amazing. And to me, to think of those two guys together, one of the most rigid, fundamentalist, and the others, Isaac Singer, had 10 different, ten different families, I think, none of which knew about each other until the will was read. <laughs> uh, so, so they would not have gotten along if they talked about anything but this, but I think they just talked about so. so. Uh, here's a picture of the original he incorporated in his company, is the Nanatuck, and uh, this is a picture of him a little older than he was in the previous one, of oh, that Samuel Hill, and all of these guys were, were a foreman of the mill or directors of the mill or this or that or the other thing. Uh, it's time to and the mills became big time. And this is what they were in their heyday. Uh, and this is the area that's still Florence and there's the river still. Uh, <clears throat> and some of these mills are still there, although it's hard to tell which exactly was which. Um, and the annual product, the values of the product was zooming up with the silk. Uh, so you can see the, the main uh, Mill River industries of that in these, the turn of the 19th or the 20th century were uh, silk cutlery and metal products and wood products, and silk was way far above the most uh, lucrative of all of them. Uh, so it really was making the whole whole valley hum. Um, this is one of the, at the uh, advertising cards that the company put out early on, and it, you know it's a little funny because they show the worm and the leaf, but they weren't. Crazy the works. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, machine twists, gain sewing twists, the different kinds of things that they had, embroidery thread, they were making lots of different things. Um, Florence knit goods, silk underwear, silk hosiery, mittens, all this kind of stuff. Um, was, was there actually a corticelli involved, or was that name used to make it sound Italian? Yeah. Oh. You asked the question I was just about to answer. Oh, <laughs> it was, They made that up. Uh, it, it means. I, read, I found some neat interpretation of it somewhere, some beautiful silk or something like that. I mean, they invented the name and they did it on purpose to make it sound tight. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's still a Porticelli street in Florence, and, you know, they're all over the place, but it was totally invented. It was just, just to make it sound tight. Uh, and then they became big time in this country. It became probably the biggest, I think it was the biggest silk thread manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the United States, and these are some of their ads they had. And uh, Elaine brought in, uh, was, it, was it who brought this? Oh, you brought it, right? Fine. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Brought, yeah, uh, the, uh, some, some of the thread. This is quote that she had. This is, you can come and look at this later. This is different kinds of thread. There's a, this is a knitting thread, although how anyone can get something so fine is hard to imagine. And then different kinds of threads, but they're all the course that are here. Thank you again for bringing that. <coughs> and they even made it to 42nd and 41st of Broadway, downtown New York. Uh, with this up here, the, the uh, kitten was playing, it was moving uh, the image up here of the kitten playing with the thread. And then here's a postcard that was made of it with a quarter silk, uh, 42nd of Broadway. This is 1912. This is the actual photograph that I found online. Of, and there's the this will soak up there. So it was as big as it, as it could be at the time. And, and they use it wasn't just for knitting, sewing, and things like that. This is from the, um, they merged, in the 20s, they, the Corticelli Company, or the Nanata Company, merged with a, another one called Heming, Hemingway Velvet, 
which made silk cloth. And they had that top type that go from not just thread, but to thread and cloth together. And they merged and called it, of course, the silk company. So the name was changed. They never did do the cloth. But anyway, the various uses made of silk were really wonderful. And, uh, some of the ones not generally known or given. Uh, insulating wires for the incandescent lamps. Filaments were the same. Uh, surgeon for tying arteries and sewing together cuts in the flesh. And covering silk cloth with gum. What? I got it. Thank you. <laughs> for adhesive and non poisonous plasters, and the dentist to clear between the teeth and tie the pellicle in filling, and the bookmaker ties fancy little booklets and cards, and the surveyor and the fisherman, um, and adaptability of all these uses because of its great strength and durability. So they were selling it for all kinds of purposes, but the one that they most advertised were the, the threads that were used for sewing and for embroidery and so on. Um, and this was going strong. Uh, but uh, things were not going terribly well on the labor front. That as they got bigger and bigger, they, the workers got more and more unhappy with the way they were paid, the way they were treated, and it was a big strike. Um, this is from the Gazette in May 4th of 1923. And um, they eventually got it resolved, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the clouds were on the horizon, and as you all know, the big Great Depression, which is a few years later, came. And there were other things, too, that they were unaware of at the time. Uh, first of all, tensions with Japan got worse, so getting the raw silk became more of a problematical. And that ceased altogether before World War II. Uh, that was one big problem. Another big problem was the invention of nylon. And uh, the silk was doomed. I mean, why go to all this trouble with these <laughs> worms and all the trouble they cause? Uh, when you can just make it in a lab. And so that was already, but they didn't see that coming. So anyway, this uh, they were shocked to death, literally, when when uh, things shut down. And they shut down at the, about 1930, everything collapsed. Not only the local companies here, but also companies in America collapsed with the Great Depression. And then they published this uh, last report, the Silk Association. It had been hoped that the aviation industry would produce a new outlet for the manufacture of silk thread but latterly, the wings and planes, which at the start had been sewn with silk, have been made very largely with metal. And uh, they could not foresee that there would be bigger planes that would even, there was no way that this would work. But that was what they they'd been pinning their hopes on at the very end. So this was the end, and that was the end of the industry. And uh, the McCallum's company here was making stockings, and they continued to make those for a little longer, but then, uh, then in came the, the nylon and you know, the silk ended it all together, and then they just gave up. So that was the, that's the story. And um, what's left of it in town, the only symbol really, there's Corticelli Street in Florence, and then there's this mural in downtown Northampton. And if you look closely, you see at the back, there are women standing at machines. These are winding skeins onto bobbins or vice versa and so forth. That's, the, that's their uh, representation here in this. And this is some of the things that we did in the Northampton Silk Project. It was huge. Um, exhibitions and symposium and research all over the place and lecture series and the quilt that Sally made and uh, bike walk, touring guide, all that. And we have a, a website. It's all there. And you can still see all of that uh, now. And then we had, uh, we had advisors. This is Alexander Joji, who had been the head of the Albanian silk industry, which is Albania was the only country in Europe, the only communist country in Europe that was allied with China, not with Russia. This is for historical reasons that we don't have time to go into, but that meant that they, China got interested in the old Albanian silk industry got re-going there, and he spent a lot of time back and forth between China and Albania, and he, uh, at this point, we had met him, he was very nice, he came over and he advised us on every step of the way, and donated the first silkworm eggs to us so that we could get the project started. And this is his wife, Ida. And here's Elaine. <laughs> I'm right here. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry I forgot her name. This is Fred uh, Morrison. <laughs> and Fred uh, is the one who had worked with the students to raise the silkworms and had to go find the mulberry leaves to feed them, uh, which meant going in wider and wider circles around North Hampton looking for trees <laughs> and cutting down branches. At the end of the project, he decided to retire. <laughs> But they're still raising the worms uh, for fun. He and Laura, Laura, his wife is the head director of historical camp. Um, and so I'll just conclude with a picture of the quilt again and thanking all the people who were involved in this. And there's many, many more that I don't uh, 
don't have room to list here, but anyway, it was very fun. And uh, I'm amazed at how many people are still interested out there in the world. I get regularly uh, questions and things from people all over the world, which I can't answer. I have questions I don't know. But at least they can, you know, maybe take the trouble to write. So, um, and thank you all for coming in. That's, that's it. Questions? Do we have time for any? Yeah. What about the Skinner Silk Mill? Ah, okay, that's a good question. The Skinner Silk Mill was part of the uh, the, the complex on the Mill River. And what this was that, and this was in the period just before the Nanachuk really got going. And the Skinner Mills were there, and there, but all the local silk companies uh, were concerned about the Mill River irregularities. Um, especially the water flow and so on. Uh, and so they constructed a dam uh, so that the river would serve all of them better. And they did this with very shoddy engineering. And they knew this was a problem, but they were doing it on cheap. And so they paid as little as possible to construct the dam. And then one bright day, uh, there was a dam fell. And the whole valley was flooded. And Skinner, who had been one of the manufacturers there, was totally wiped out. He lost everything. Not a tuck. Hill did not lose everything, so Hill kept going, and, but uh, Skinner was wiped out. And uh, then Holyoke invited him to come down there and rebuild his mill and the whole works there. He did that, and he rebuilt his house brick by brick, I understand, and Wisteria Hurst today is, was his house. Uh, we could, the recreation of his house that had been up in, in this area. And so then his, his mill, they went just into cloth. They didn't use the thread. And so there wasn't any competition with the Nottetuck. And that became one of the great silk companies, too. But it also ended at the same time. Maybe it went on a little longer than that one. But thanks for asking about that, because it's an important part of the history. Yes? The manufactured silk threads for just for showing in the name, do you know if any fabric was manufactured from those Not, No. Now, that's another thing. Um, Whitmarsh, back in the early days, did have a loom. And he invited people to come out and see. And, but he apparently was just a showroom, and he wasn't really manufacturing it. He was just showing, trying to get people to invest in mulberry trees that he was selling. And so so uh, when Hill, uh, the association didn't try to make cloth, and Hill didn't either. But there were other companies that did. And so the Belding Hemingway, which is the one that Hill merged with later, not a joke. Uh, and at that time, they thought, yes, let's do that. And there were some silk, uh, in, in this country, there were silk um, cloth manufacturers, but they were a little bit later. So the book, which I didn't bring with me, that I did with uh, two other people, we each took a different mill and uh, looked at them. They, they together spanned 150 years or something. And this was the earliest one. And the Haskell Mills in Maine were another one. That came a little later, and they made cloth. And then there was, I forgot the name of the other one in New York that was very fancy. Uh, and that was the high end fashion. So they, but this here locally was all thread, essentially. But they found a lot of uses for thread. I mean, they were very creative marketers. So, and people were having a good time doing all the knitting. <laughs> they had a whole series called Home Needlework of all the ways you could spend your time. <laughs> I was told once that one of the motivations to the silk industry in Florence. <coughs> was abolitionism. It was the idea of undercutting cotton plantations that were slave-run. Mm -hmm. And is that another thing like Corticelli? They just made it up to make it sound No, no, bad? that's true. Uh, what, what that's true, I should have mentioned, when the association took over Whitmarsh's business, mm -hmm. Whitmarsh, ever, he, he didn't care about these things. But they were abolitionists. And so when they wanted to have a business, it had to be a business that met their ethical standards. Mm -hmm. And so Silk did because um, they felt that there was a future for textiles and for bread, but they didn't want to deal with cotton because they didn't want to deal with slave products. Mm -hmm. So they felt that, not realizing that silk was going to make slaves out of them, um, <laughs> <laughs> they thought silk would be just the right thing, that it was ethically pure. Okay. And that also there were others who took that same view, that, which is the, the um, Bronson Alcott's, uh, what was the name of that? You took me to the Boston. Yeah, Fruitlands mm -hmm. had also had, uh, tried to, move, to at least to be away from cotton, and they would try. They tried so far for a little bit, not as seriously as this group did, though. Mm -hmm. But for the same reason. But it was considered really a, a, the ethically pure textile. Yeah. 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 Ye
Well, child labor instead of slave labor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just didn't have a clue how difficult it was. And all those little fussy things that the Europeans and the, the, the uh, Turks and others and Chinese had developed over those years, they were, some of them, probably unnecessary, uh, that you should let, hatch the silkworms the day that you see the first star in the sky and that the first mm -hmm. little baby comes out, and that all that should be done coordinated. And uh, that You can probably be a little not so rigid about all those things. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they did have reasons for them, and they had to be thought through, and, and these people didn't think it through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> you know, I was involved in that initial project with the curriculum development, and I cannot tell you how rich the experience was, meeting the gentleman who was heading up the silk industry, yeah. Uh, to have that access to so much specialized information was just wonderful. And we had such a good time, the teachers involved had such a fabulous time. So, And I'm so happy to hear you speak again. Thank you. Well, you had a wonderful curriculum project there. And guess, well, explain what happened to that. Why? Well, I think the main thing that went on was Fred's part of the project. Fred Morrison or was a science teacher, and so he took on the project of raising the worms, as Michael said, and he had that going on in his classroom, and it was just a marvel. Now, my aspect I, as an English teacher, I never quite had the chance to carry it out because of curriculum uh, demands and all of that, but there were so many rich stories that were the potential to come out of that, this whole session, so. It would have been a great unit for the yeah. school. Yeah. 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 I still think yeah. 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 But with the pressures of MCAS and we all think they didn't have time to put in something like that. Right, but Fred made his part happen. Yeah. Yeah. He had all those worms. <laughs> 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 once and once only. <laughs> One of my favorite stories is from the pre-industrial in the 1830s out of Munson where the person uh, was writing about how annoyed he was at night where they, uh, his daughters were raising the silkworms in the parlor and his chamber was above and they hear them chewing. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're noisy and they're, yeah. they're smelly too. That was another problem. That people could just stand to go in the barn because they were so smelly. And then they, one, one of them gets sick and they all die. You know, so yeah. Yeah. You to, uh, is that quilt available for view somewhere still? Is the quilt? It's, well, it's in our house. Oh. And you're welcome to come visit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let me just tell you one thing. Uh, well, let me answer a question and I'll say that. In the early, uh, maybe the late 70s, in the, at the auction gallery that used to be uh, at 116 and 63, Hubbard's, mm -hmm. maybe Hubbard's then, mm -hmm. Hubbard and Murphy. They often had cabinets that must have been in department stores yeah. Yeah. with the Corticelli, uh, this beautiful drawing on the, on the door of it, yeah. and it was, they held spools. That yes. must have been how you picked out the spool of thread that you wanted. Yeah, yeah. isn't one of those, the ad card, mm -hmm. let's see if I can uh, go back to it. There, this kind of thing, is this right? Kind of yeah. Now these are big. These are not little things. These are big things. Well, the, these were usually they, they would be the size of like a medicine cabinet. I yeah. mean, some people were buying them to decor, you know, to put in their homes, uh, but not smart enough to realize <laughs> not to knock off the design to put a mirror there. <laughs> <laughs> but they were really, you know, they were beautifully made. It was always hard wood, ah, yeah. uh, and you know, there were no little spools of thread inside. Which I was always looking for, but it, it was just. I clearly remembered the Corticelli, and I thought there was a Corticelli factory in Florence. I did not know the whole thing was made up. <laughs> well, they, it was. I mean, it was a factory. Yeah. Yes, but <laughs> they did because I thought that's how Florence got its name. Yeah. It was, it, oh, because they had been Italian yes, in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was wondering when people were doing it at home, were they? You doing it to sell the raw silk, or were they doing it for their own use? What I the best I can I understand is that they did it for both. They did it for their own use, and then also to barter. So that there was sort of a barter economy. They could go to the store and they could trade silk skeins of silk for something else. Okay. 
but they also used it for their own home. So what they had to do was they had to unwind it from the, the cocoons. And I didn't explain you have to do four or five or maybe even ten cocoons at a time because the, the silk is so thin. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a hundredth of a human hair. So you have to do these together. And then once you've done that on that reel, then you have to twist those together and then twist them again. And uh, it's, it's really quite production. But they did those things at home and uh, on a small scale, but enough you know, for their own sewing needs and to, to barter with the neighbors. I never heard of that, but uh, there probably was more to it. I mean, I didn't look into just how they got it around in different places. Um, but I know around here, this Dolly Stetson, for example, it was a family thing they did, and it was just just within the family and the neighbors. And the but you know, if one person's good at uh, at one stage of it, another just good at another stage of it, they can trade it, cooperate. Mm -hmm. Just a useful thing to be able to do. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you.